Good morning. Our scripture today is 1 Samuel 17, verses 38 through 44. Then Saul gave David his own armor, a bronze helmet and a coat of mail. David put it on, strapped the sword over it, and took a step or two to see what it was like, for he had never worn such things before. I can't go in these, he protested to Saul. I'm not used to them. And so David took them off again. He picked up five smooth stones from a stream and put them into his shepherd's bag. And then armed only with his shepherd's staff and a sling, he started across the valley to fight the Philistine. Goliath walked out toward David with his shield bearer ahead of him, sneering in contempt at this ruddy-faced boy. Am I a dog, he roared at David, that you come at me with a stick? And he cursed David by the names of his gods. Come over here, and I'll give your flesh to the birds and wild animals, Goliath yelled. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, welcome back to week number five of our Giant Killer sermon series. As we look at the different traits of the triumphant believer, you can see where we have been since the second week or so of April and where we are headed these last few weeks in the series. Last week, we talked about uh, being, comp being uh, what did we talk about last week? We talked about being in training. Sorry, having one of those moments this morning. We talked about being in training, and we specifically talked about how we strengthen our faith so that we're prepared when God gives us opportunities to serve. And we looked at the particular passage uh, in terms of three effective faith-building practices. We learned last week uh, that we have to bear consistent fruit. We learned that we have to get in the practice of bringing others with us and that we have to be committed to combining prayer and action. Our one-sentence sermon last week was that David's example shows that God wants to use our choices today to prepare us for extraordinary things tomorrow. And so today we want to look about look at what it looks like to be equipped. Uh, there's an old saying out there in athletics and I think also in uh, military circles uh, that says that the best defense is a good offense. And so as we pick up the story here with David, we see that Saul has uh, caved in to pressure. And really I don't think Saul had to be pushed too much. One of the things that this story seems to point out to us is that Saul is a coward. Saul is not someone who wants to be king. Saul is not someone who wants to face the challenge of walking with God and leading God's people. And so, in reality, we know from the story that Saul should have been the one going out to face Goliath. Goliath is this giant. He's nine feet, six inches tall. He has all of this armor. He has these amazing weapons. But Saul, as the king of Israel, is also the biggest person in the nation. We're told when Saul is picked to be the king that he's a head taller than any other man in the entire nation of Israel. And so he should be going out to face this giant. He should be standing up for God. But instead, by contrast, because of Saul's cowardice and because of the cowardice of the rest of the men of the armies of Israel, we have David. We have this small, skinny, 13-year-old shepherd boy who is going out to face the giant. And so Saul's approach with David is that, okay, our best hope is to give a good defense for you. And so here, put on my armor, put on my helmet, put on my chain mail to cover your chest and to cover your uh, intestines from the giant's weapons. And David refuses to do this because he buys into this idea that the best defense is a good offense. So we'll be talking about that today. This is not a particularly new concept. In fact, George Washington it historically is probably the first to verbalize this idea. If you remember your history uh, with the Revolutionary War, you know that we started out fighting against the British in traditional European combat style, which was uh, two lines facing each other, uh, not very far apart, and so one side would line up all their soldiers, and they would load their guns, and they would call out, ready, aim, fire, and they would shoot. And then the soldiers standing across the line on the other side who were hit would fall down, and then it would be their turn, ready, aim, fire, and they would shoot. And we would go back and forth like this, and then eventually the two armies would charge one another. And the reason uh, England was so successful at this early on was because they had an almost unlimited supply of soldiers. And so their best bet 
was to keep throwing soldiers in front of these bullets to stop the bullets until uh, the rebels eventually ran out of soldiers. Their best defense was a good defense, but what Washington began to understand after taking heavy losses early in the war was that this strategy was not going to work. And so in a letter to one of his generals, he says this, I must make them, the soldiers, believe that offensive operations oftentimes is the surest, if not the only means of defense. And so uh, the uh, colonials changed up their strategy. And instead of standing in line and fighting, as the British would say, like gentlemen, they began to engage in guerrilla warfare. And they would stage raids, and they would ambush, and they would come out from the trees and over the hills and out of barns and surprise the British as they were marching along. And that best defense became a good offense. In modern day terms, uh, there's another uh, example of this at the Pulaski Academy in Arkansas. Uh, for years, the football program at Pulaski was the laughing stock of the state. They would get beat in almost every game, and so they got tired of this, and they hired a young, fiery coach by the name of Kevin Kelly. And Kelly came in and he had this idea. He had done some statistical analysis of football in general, and he had uh, this strange idea that the biggest mistake that teams made is that they punt the football. And so Kelly came in and he said, we're going to do this. We're not even going to have a punter on our team. We're going to play four downs until we score a touchdown. Uh, we are going to onside kick every time we kick off, and we're going to go for two-point conversion every time we do score a touchdown. And people said, Kevin Kelly, you are nuts. And Kevin Kelly said, I'm going to do this anyway. And guess what happened? Uh, over the course of the years since he took over, uh, Pulaski has won uh, upwards of 90% of their games. They've won five uh, state football championships, and they've become an Arkansas school football powerhouse. When interviewed about this, Kelly explained it this way. He said, when you forsake a punt, you give your offense a chance to stay on the field. It's like somebody said, punting is just what you do on fourth down, and everybody did it without asking why. It's the same question that George Washington asked himself early in the Revolutionary War. For some reason, somebody said we have to stand up with two lines of soldiers facing each other and take turns firing at each other, and nobody asked why. It's the same thing with David. We've seen that he approaches this line of soldiers who's all hiding in fear from Goliath, saying, we can't do this, we can't defeat this giant, and David says, why can't we defeat the giant? What if we did something differently? What if we employed a good offense instead of a defense? Our foundational thought for this morning is that triumphant Christians learn to shift their focus from the challenge at hand to the God who is more than capable of overcoming it. Bob Sorge puts it this way, and I think this is very, very applicable for our situation today. He says, the nature of the enemy's warfare in your life is to cause you to become discouraged and to cast away your confidence, to give up your hope of God's deliverance. The enemy wants to numb you into a coping kind of Christianity that has given up hope of seeing God's resurrection power. I don't know about you, but eight plus weeks into this COVID mess, uh, I have days, sometimes more days than not, where I wake up and I'm very tempted to lapse into a coping kind of Christianity. I'm very tempted to give up hope of seeing God's resurrection power in this situation. I'm very tempted to take the same attitude that Saul and the rest of the soldiers for the armies of Israel took on in this story where I'm going to hide from the giant and I'm just going to wait for all of this to pass. And yet David's story today is going to indicate that we need to take the exact opposite approach. The question this morning is how can I fight? And we're going to look at three weapons that are demonstrated here that defeat giants 100% of the time. We're going to see weapon number one is God's faithfulness, weapon number two, God's promises, and weapon number three, God's power. Our one-sentence sermon this morning is that David's example shows that as we stand up to life's giants, we're never unprepared and we are never alone. So we begin with the first weapon, which is God's faithfulness. It's interesting because David not only sets aside Saul's armor because it's too heavy, because it's unfamiliar, it's too cumbersome, but then he goes the opposite direction and he goes to a riverbed and we're told that first thing he does is he picks up five smooth stones. 
Most of you are familiar with the famous words, Houston, we have a problem. They come from uh, the Apollo 13 mission in 1970 when there were equipment malfunctions very early in the Apollo mission to the moon. Uh, Houston was alerted that there was a problem. Uh, they had to put the astronauts into the uh, lunar escape module, uh, which was not designed to take care of three astronauts and especially not designed to take care of them for the 96 hours it was going to take to come back to Earth. And so one of the myriad of problems they had was that the carbon dioxide scrubbers in that particular capsule were designed to uh, provide for two astronauts for about 36 hours, not three astronauts for 96 hours. And so there was a very real danger that unless they could change out the filter canisters on a regular basis, they were going to die of carbon dioxide poisoning. And worse yet was that the canisters they had were the ones that were designed for the main part of the module, not for uh, the escape module. And the two did not fit. And so they sent this problem down to Mission Control, and the engineers at Mission Control frantically began to try to put together a plan to help them build an adapter for the canisters that were designed for the main module that would fit in the scrubbers for the escape module. What they came up with was ingenious, and here were the ingredients for it. Number one, they needed a flight plan manual cover. They were told to rip the cover off the flight plan, plan manual and use that to build the adapter. They needed one roll of duct tape, so we know that some things haven't changed since 1970. Duct tape still fixes everything. They needed two plastic bags, they needed two tube socks, they needed two hoses from their spacesuits, one bungee cord, and they needed about an hour of assembly time. And what was interesting to me and that applies to our points this morning is that their instructions from Mission Control were prefaced with this statement. They reassured the astronauts and they said, all required equipment is contained on board within the craft. This is not impossible. We've provided you with everything that you need in order to overcome this challenge, in order to be safe and secure. And this is the same message that God is sending to David as he picks up these five smooth stones. David, I have provided everything within you, within your situation to help you overcome this giant that I will give you victory over today. It's interesting that he picks up stones. Uh, the word stone here uh, talks about a common piece of rock. The word aven just means a rock that you would find lying around outside. It's not a precious jewel. It's not a special magical kind of rock. It's just any kind of rock that you would pick up off the ground. It can also mean something that's heavy or substantial. This word is used throughout scripture. It's used to symbolize particular things. Uh, David talks about it later on in his life when he writes prophetically in Psalm 118. He says the stone, the aben, that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. Uh, that's a word that we tend to misuse. We think of it in terms of an actual cornerstone that's on the corner of a building. But in David's time, it would have referred to what we today call a keystone. So you can see when they would build a stone archway, uh, the last stone that they would put in place, the one that takes the load, that holds the arch together, that keeps it from collapsing, is the cornerstone. And so the cornerstone had to be solid. It had to be high quality. It had to be perfectly shaped. And so... David is saying, man doesn't see things the way God sees things. That stone, that cornerstone, that keystone that everybody rejected has ended up being the cornerstone. And he says that's not because of anything man has done. This is the Lord's doing, and it's wonderful to see. Jesus was that cornerstone that the builders had rejected, and now it becomes the most important piece of the puzzle. In writing about this particular concept, Charles Haddon Spurgeon tells us that the significance of stone throughout the Bible in its widest sense is that it points to this idea of lasting truth. It's symbolic of truth, of God's faithfulness that's lasted throughout the ages and that transcends circumstances and fears and attitudes. Uh, stop and think about that for a minute. Uh, God sends His commandments, His Ten Commandments, down from the mountain with Moses. And what are they written on? They're written on stone tablets. This is lasting truth that you need to carry with you, that you need to hold on to as you face the challenges ahead of you. Stone was used in that particular culture to mark boundary lines. And so when you were marking out your property, you would make piles of stones at the corners 
of your property so that you could settle disputes and you could say, okay, from here on out, this is my land on this side of the pile of stones and this is your land on this side of the pile of stones. Uh, but the biggest example that I came up with was uh, what they called an Ebenezer. If you grew up in church, you remember singing the hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. And there's a particular verse in that that many of us of a certain age have sung over and over and over again throughout our lives and maybe never even thought about what it means. Uh, it says, here, uh, here I lay my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I'm found. And we, we sing those words and we don't even think about it. We think, that's a weird name. It reminds me of Ebenezer Scrooge from A Christmas Carol. But what does the word Ebenezer really mean? It's a combination of two Hebrew root words. Aben, which means stone, and Ezer, which means help or deliverance. And so an Ebenezer was a stone of help or deliverance. And you can see uh, the picture of one there in the graphic. Uh, what the people of Israel would do was anytime God was faithful... They would gather a whole bunch of stones up and they would build this huge monument, this huge pile of rocks that they would leave behind as a marker so that when people passed that way, they would ask, what's that all about? And people could say, oh, well, that's there because here's what God did. And so from generation to generation, from everlasting to everlasting, they would have these Ebenezers, these stones of help or deliverance that would remind them that God is faithful. God can be trusted. God's truth is lasting. Uh, a great example of that was when they crossed the Jordan into the Promised Land. God parts the waters of the Jordan at the highest flood stage. And so uh, before they uh, finished crossing over into the Promised Land, they created an Ebenezer in the middle of the Jordan River so that uh, when the waters came back down again to their normal levels, there would be this weird Ebenezer out in the middle to remind them as they walked by the Jordan River, oh yeah, God was there for us. God got us through this difficult time. What it reminds us of today is that giant killers understand that our success doesn't depend on what we have. We don't have to have anything special. God can take the most basic, the most random stuff, and He can use it for His purposes, for His victory. It doesn't depend on what we have, but it depends on what God provides. And so God provides David with five smooth very common stones. Our first key point is that we can always place our confidence in God as we remember that He created us for an eternal purpose. He created those stones for an eternal purpose. He created us for an eternal purpose. Neither of us is remarkable. It's not about what we can do or what those stones can do. It's about what those stones can do in God's hand and what we can do in God's hand. Uh, you can see there... Uh, Mike Biggers uh, says this, The promises of the Bible are nothing more than God's covenant to be faithful to his people. It is his character that makes these promises valid. David was able to trust God to use these stones because he knew God. He knew God's character. He trusted in that. And he was able to be delivered in those circumstances. There's a great passage in Revelation 2 that gives me hope. And I hope it gives you hope as well. Uh, it says in the, at the end, when we stand before God, and God finds us faithful, to everyone who is victorious, I will give a white stone, a purified symbol of my truthfulness, of my faithfulness. And on that stone will be engraved a new name that no one understands except the one who receives it. I will no longer be Brian. I will no longer have my failures and my shortcomings and my regrets from this life, from this world, but instead when I stand face to face with God, He's going to hand me a stone and say, you have been faithful, I've been faithful to you. All the past is wiped away. All the pain that you suffered, here's who you really are. Who's, here's who I have seen you to be since the beginning of the creation. God is faithful, and that's a powerful weapon. Secondly, our second weapon is God's provision. So David picks up the five smooth stones, he puts them in his shepherd bag, and then it says he progresses across the valley toward the giant with two things in hand. The first is his shepherd's staff. Uh, you have to stop and remind yourself, this is not a club, uh, this is not some kind of a spiked weapon of war, but instead it's the very common shepherd's staff that we think of with the crook on the end of it. It's not a thick uh, piece of wood, it's something that Goliath could easily snatch away from David and snap in half and throw away. So this is not 
uh, a weapon that David's going to be able to use to hurt Goliath, but there's a specific symbolic purpose for this. There are a lot of different theories in psychology of uh, different ways that we can look at personality or this lens through which we see the world around us and we interpret circumstances and we understand ourselves and other people. And one of those was uh, discovered by a couple of people by the name of Costa and McCray, and they call it the five-factor model of personality. They say there are five things that make up human personality. One of those is what they call our level of conscientiousness. In other words, are you a person who is good to keep their word? If you say you're going to be there at a particular time, are you there on time? If there's a deadline, do you meet that deadline? If you make a promise, do you keep that promise? The second one is extroversion. Are you somebody who's energized by being around other people? Or are you energized by being more introverted? Somebody who likes to be by themselves and likes things to be quiet. Uh, the third one is agreeableness. Do you like people? Do you get along well with other people? Can you be pleasant? Can you be, uh, can you be a good person to be around? The next one is neuroticism. Neuroticism is basically a fancy way of saying, are you a worry wart? Are you somebody who assumes the worst case scenario is going to happen? Are you that person that lies awake at night, uh, wondering whether disaster is going to befall you or not? Or are you somebody that just kind of goes with the flow? And then the last one, uh, which they say is kind of the keystone to all of this, is what they call openness to experience. Openness to experience is this measure of, are you somebody who is open to doing new things? When somebody says, hey, do you want to go check out this new restaurant? Yep, I'm in. Uh, do you want to try this roller coaster? Absolutely, that'll be fun. You assume that life is full of good experiences, life is full of things that are going to make you better and help you grow. Uh, you can see there Robert McCray observes this. He says, openness to experience high levels of this particular factor of personality has been found to have significant associations with happiness, positive mood, quality of life, and life satisfaction. In other words, people who are open to new experiences as they move through life tend to be happier. They tend to have better lives. They tend to have better outcomes. And as we look at David, we see somebody who has a high level of openness to experience. He looks around and he says, there's a giant. The giant needs to be killed. Sure, I'm up for that because God has my back. I'm not going to worry about it. So David goes forward with this staff in his hand. The word here, makel, uh, means an almond tree branch. It's a particular type of branch. And this isn't to say that every shepherd's staff was made of almond tree, but this particular one in this story we're told is. And as we're going to see, there's a reason for that. It can also mean a shoot, which is a, you know, a small skinny branch that's coming out of a tree. It's not a mature branch yet. And in their particular culture, an almond tree branch was symbolic of a journey. And that's what's important for us to focus on here. Uh, we see this particular term used in Exodus as God is commanding the children of Israel at Passover time. He's saying, I'm going to deliver you from the Egyptians, and so here's what you need to do. You're going to cook this last meal before you leave Egypt and you're going to eat it, but you're going to do it in a certain way. Here are your instructions. Be fully dressed, wear your sandals, and carry your makel, your almond tree branch, your walking stick in your hand. In other words, it is symbolic of saying, God's getting ready to come through. I don't see it yet. Maybe I don't even feel it yet, but I'm going to act my way into feeling by being fully dressed, by keeping my shoes on, by having my walking stick, my preparation to take this journey in my hand. And that's what David is doing as he takes his shepherd's staff with him. Uh, L.J. Musselman, I'm talking about the symbolism associated in the scriptures with the almond branch, says this, the almond tree is a well-known symbol of resurrection. Things being hopeless and suddenly God coming through, God doing a great and a mighty and a powerful thing. It's symbolic of resurrection because the almond tree is the first to flower every year. While all the rest of the trees are waiting to see if it's really spring yet, we know in Israel, almond trees burst into full bloom. They're ready. They're saying spring is here. If spring's not here yet, spring's coming. And we're going to go ahead and get after it. And he says also something interesting here. He says the Hebrew word for almond sounds like the word for watchful. If you study much of the scriptures and you study the Hebrew language and the Hebrew culture, you'll see that they were very fond of uh, playing on words in their stories. And so a lot of times they'll use a particular word 
that sounds like another word because it helped them have a chuckle. It helped them remember the stories as they told them. And so it's not just that David is picking up this almond tree branch as a walking stick and taking it up against this giant, but it's also that he's preparing for a journey and that he is being watchful. He's waiting to see what God is going to do. I'm looking for that opportunity. I'm looking for that opening that I know you're going to provide. You see, giant killers understand that God provides not as we wait, not as we sit in fear, not as we uh, pray for deliverance while we're hiding, but instead as we move forward in obedience. And God provides as we move, not before we move. I don't know about you, I'm not real high in openness to experience and my personality. I would much prefer that God provides ahead of time, that God says, okay, here's everything you need. I've laid it all out. Here's a timeline. Here's a contract that I've already signed. Here are uh, different milestones along the way that you can count on. Now you can move forward. But God never does that. Instead, God says, go do this. I'll provide as you go. And that's because faith is always meant to be a verb. Our second key point, we can move forward with confidence when we remember that it's God's mission. It's not my mission. It's not your mission. It's not this church's mission. It's God's mission for me and for you and for this church. And because it's his mission, he supplies all that is needed to accomplish it. And he will supply just in time. Uh, the great Christian missionary Hudson Taylor, in reflecting on his years of experience in the mission field, says God's work done in God's way will never lack God's provision. David understood that. He said, this is God's work. I'm committed to doing it God's way. And because of that, I can be assured that as I carry my walking stick with me, my commitment to stay on the journey, God will provide. Paul talks about this in 2 Corinthians 9, verse 8, when he says this, God is able to bless you abundantly so that having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. I think that's a word for, a word for us to remember as a church as we begin to plan how do we move forward coming out of some of these limitations? Because things still look pretty uncertain. Things still look pretty grim. And yet, God has promised, I will provide. I will show you the way as you move forward. Lastly, we see that God's power is uh, the tool that we use to overcome the giants. So not only does he take his walking stick, but he also takes his sling. The sling is something that David would have spent years and years learning how to use. And if you want to hear a really interesting historical exposition of this uh, whole story and the things behind it, Malcolm Gladwell has a great TED talk that he does about David and Goliath. And he gets into great detail about what this sling was like and about uh, the velocity that this sling could reach and the accuracy with which a Hebrew shepherd would be able to use that sling and to take a rock and put it uh, pinpointed exactly where they want it to go. Uh, so he has this sling with him. Uh, this, this part, we kind of get in the weeds a little bit. Uh, I'm going to admit right up front, I'm not an expert in physics, and I'm not going to do a perfect job of explaining this, but this idea of um, the discovery of the God particle and of the CERN Corporation's Large Hadron Collider uh, kind of fits in here, so I want to do my best to fumble through and explain this. Physicists have theorized for a long time that time is not linear like we have always assumed that it is. In other words, uh, we don't have 1820, 1920, 2020, but instead they're taken and it's like a napkin or a piece of paper that's folded down into multiple layers. And so 1820, 1920, 2020 are all right on top of each other. It's just a matter of moving through different layers in order to get there in that space-time continuum. And so a uh, number of years ago, 20-some odd years ago, uh, the CERN Corporation in Switzerland uh, decided they were going to start investigating this idea. And so they created something they called the Large Hadron Collider. And uh, the graphic there you can see is of the city, an overhead map of the city in Switzerland where the CERN Collider is located. Uh, you can't actually see it from the air because it's about 100 meters underground, but it's this giant tunnel that is about um, 17 miles in circumference. And it runs underneath the ground. It's just this tunnel. And what they do is they pump different types of particles into it and they send 
one type of particle in one direction around the tunnel and one type in the other, and it builds up speed as they go round and round and round, and eventually they collide them, and as those particles collide, it creates different types of energy. And in the process of doing this research, uh, they discovered a couple of things. One is they discovered that there's something called the Higgs field, which if we think about time and these different dimensions being stacked on top of each other like this folded piece of paper, uh, the Higgs field is able to encompass all of these different dimensions. Uh, so the Higgs field existed from the beginning of time, it will exist until the end of time, and it exists all at once in the midst of that. But the Higgs field is uh, composed partially of this thing that they have discovered with the Large Hadron Collider that they call the God Particle, because this particle actually has the ability to move freely throughout the Higgs field, throughout all these different dimensions of time. So this particle, as Kelly Dickerson says, is associated with this Higgs field, and it permeates all of the space-time continuum. It helps give other particles their mass, and so some physicists have theorized that this is the particle that allowed creation to take place. And we've discovered this, and there are some people, uh, these are unfounded rumors, I don't know if they're true or not, but they're saying that they've actually been able to figure out how to penetrate that Higgs field, and they've been able to move between dimensions. And I've actually read things where people have said that some of the problems we're having today is because they've opened that door, that gateway between dimensions, and it's causing all kinds of chaos. I have no idea if that's true, I have no idea uh, if that even makes sense from a physics standpoint, uh, but it speaks to the fact that there is a power at work that is above and beyond anything that we can understand. And it transcends space, it transcends time, it transcends the laws of physics that we live by on this particular planet. So we're told in the Hebrew that David brings his sling. And the word sling can mean several different things, but all of them are interrelated, and all of them apply to this concept of uh, these powers that are beyond our understanding, beyond our comprehension. The word for sling can mean a doorway or it can mean a curtain. Uh, it can mean to carve or to etch, and it can also mean a voice. And so if you've ever used one of these kind of slings where you spin it around and around and around, you know that as it moves, it begins to cut the air. It begins to make a whistling sound or it sings. There's a voice that's produced by that sling as it moves. But it's also referred to in terms of a doorway or a curtain. Uh, you can see the picture there of uh, the inner court of the temple, Solomon's temple. Uh, if you remember the architecture of that temple, you had an outer court outside, and then you had uh, this first court that the common person could come into. They could uh, pay for animals to be sacrificed. They could make prayers of atonement, but eventually the priest would have to take those animals that they had purchased for sacrifice into the inner court, where you can see the picture of it there, and they're offering these sacrifices on behalf of the people for their sins to God. And then once a year, there was this inner sanctum of the temple called the Holy of Holies, where the Spirit of God was supposed to dwell uh, within the Ark of the Covenant. And behind that curtain, underneath those uh, angels that are carved over the doorway, one time a year, one priest was allowed to go behind that curtain to meet with God, to offer sacrifices for the entire nation. Uh, this was a huge responsibility, and that priest had to be a good and holy person, and they had to go through these purification rituals in order to do that. And it was also a calculated risk, because uh, sometimes God was really unhappy with the sacrifice or with the sins of the people, and he would strike that priest dead, and so the priest would go in with a rope tied around one of their ankles, because nobody else was allowed behind that curtain, and so if God struck him dead, they would have to pull the rope and pull the body out so that they could bury it. Uh, so uh, this was a big deal. So when they're talking about uh, kala, that sling idea, it's that idea of that curtain that separates man from God, that separates that dimension. It cuts us off from powers that we can't understand, that we can't comprehend. In uh, 1 Kings 6.29, it talks about this, and it's describing Solomon's temple. And it says, Solomon decorated the walls of the inner sanctuary in the main room with carvings, kala, etchings of cherubim, palm trees and open flowers. And so you can see the etchings, the carvings that are above that curtain that indicate this is the Holy of Holies. This is the marker that differentiates your world from my world, according to God. In talking about this concept, uh, the Hebrew uh, priest, Chaim Benroth, uh, explains it this way. He says, God does not have to speak with an audible voice produced by air, the diaphragm, and vocal cords, but instead he speaks with energy 
that can pass through the space-time continuum. When God wants to do something, He speaks, He acts, He moves things, things happen according to His plan, He cuts through that doorway, He cuts through our limitations, and He makes great things happen. And so giant killers understand that barriers are removed, that doors are open as we grow in knowledge, as we grow in obedience, and as we grow in the proper use of God's Word. David understood that, and he went forward with his sling, understanding that as I act, as I'm obedient, God will open the door at the proper time, and God's power will be unleashed to accomplish His purposes. Last key point is that we can face pain, we can face uncertainty with confidence when we understand that God's been equipping us for the challenge all along. David talked about in our last uh, sermon in this series about his qualifications, about the things God had allowed him to learn, the things God had allowed him to become an expert at that now become very important in this fight with the giant. And the same is true for me, the same is true for you. God has been opening doors. He's been leading you down a path every day of your life up to this point so that he can use those skills, that wisdom, that faith that you've built over the course of time for his glory and for his purposes. The question is, do we see it that way or do we miss those opportunities? And Timothy Kelly speaks to this. Uh, he says, there's a purpose to suffering and if faced rightly, it can drive us like a nail deep into the love of God and into more stability and spiritual power than you can imagine. David faced hardship. David faced disappointment. David faced struggles leading up to his fight with Goliath, and he faced even more afterwards. But they all were allowed to drive him like a nail deeper into God's love and its stability and spiritual power that helped him be the man that God wanted him to be. In reflecting on this in Psalm 119, David says this, God, your word is a lamp to guide my feet. It's a light for my path. We always have a choice in difficult times and dark times. Do we take the light with us? Do we delve into God's Word? Do we lean into who God has shown Himself to be? Or do we choose to stay in darkness and to wander in confusion and discouragement? Three questions to ask yourself again this week. Number one, how has God come through for me in the past year? If I'm going to build an Ebenezer, if I'm going to build a stone of help or a stone of deliverance, what are the individual rocks? The times when God's helped me with this health challenge. The time when God has healed a particular relationship problem. When God has provided financially or materially. When God has encouraged my heart. And I'm going to encourage you to go back through your memories and think very honestly about all the times that God's provided for you. Number two, uh, what has God given me that I can put to His use today? Maybe I don't have anything spectacular. Maybe I don't have any amazing powers or abilities. But God's given me something. And it could be something as simple as a shepherd's staff. It could be something as simple as the willingness to take the next step forward in the journey that God has put me on. And finally, what experiences have equipped me to serve? What is my sling? What is my uh, ability to tap into what God is saying to me and to be faithful? Let's pray. God, we thank you that your word is true. We thank you that these stories give us great insight into who you are and who you have been and who you always will be. That they instruct us in what it means to be your man and your woman in difficult times and in easy times, in times when we feel confident and in times when we're unsure. Uh, but the common denominator, as always, God, please help us to remember is that you are faithful, that you are able, and that you will accomplish your purposes in and through us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to come back next week for installment number six. The next trait of the triumphant believer is confidence. I'll leave you with this benediction from Romans chapter 15. Everything that was written in the past is for our instruction, so that through endurance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Amen. Go in peace.